Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewWeekOn.com. So we've made it through the class and we've taken our AP macro and microeconomics exams. Uh, today we're going to be doing an unboxing video. I just got the uh, AP macro exam questions that were released just a few hours ago. I've gone through, I've do, done my best to uh, answer these questions. Uh, so we're going to go over my answers. These are not official answers. I don't work for the college board. I don't know what the actual rubrics are going to say. But uh, based on previous rubrics and my understanding of macroeconomics, these are my best guesses. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into the questions. Uh, before we do that, uh, if you like this video, please don't forget to like the video to help the algorithm and subscribe to the channel. If you've already done that, I really appreciate all your help uh, with supporting this channel. And uh, that's pretty much it. Make sure you tell your friends about uh, ReviewEcon.com, the, re the review games and the articles on ReviewEcon.com, as well as this YouTube channel in the future to, uh, to help your friends out. All right, let's get into the question. Uh, this is set number one. Now, there are two sets that have been released. Uh, if you didn't get either these questions or set two questions, you may have gotten one of the other sets that is not going to be released. Uh, that's unfortunate but uh, that does happen. So th don't think that there's anything wrong if you didn't see these questions. They only re release two of the sets that, that, you may, that may have been out there. But these are the majority of questions that students within the United States uh, are mostly going to be seeing. So here's set one. Uh, first question number one, we're going to assume that uh, Vanderlandia is in short run equilibrium with a real GDP output of $500 million, their full employment level of output is $550 million, and we're going to draw an ASAD model uh, with the labels that we typically see in here. We're going to label the current output Y1, price level PL1, and the full employment level of output YF. So here is our graph right there, and uh, as you can see, we've got our uh, recessionary gap. That's what we've got here. So YF must be to the uh, to the right of Y1. So we have a recessionary gap. That's what the graph should look like. I expect this graph will be worth two of the rubric points. Next, we're going to assume that there's no policy action taken to restore uh, full employment, and we need to explain how the economy will uh, adjust in the long run. So here's my explanation here. In the long run, wages and other input prices, but wages is the focus, uh, will fall because of that recessionary gap. And that's going to cause SRES to shift to the right because of the lower input costs. And that increases real output back to YF. I don't think you'll need that last little bit there. But uh, last year I didn't get, I, there were two rubric points out of all the questions I answered that I know I didn't get. Uh, and it, because I've made some mistakes on explaining and, and one mistake I actually contradicted myself in, in that explanation. So trying to make sure I get all the points this year. So moving on to the next part, on part B2, we uh, are going to follow, following the long run adjustment process, will the price level in uh, Vanderlandia be greater than, less than, or equal to the PL1 we saw in our graph earlier. So it's actually going to be less than, and that's because uh, the uh, rightward shift of short run aggregate supply curve is going to cause the price level to fall, to be less than where it had been before. All right, moving on to part C. Uh, instead, we're going to assume that the policymakers in Vanderlandia are considering changing government spending to restore the full employment output, uh, and they have a marginal propensity to save of 0.2. We're going to calculate the minimum amount of change uh, in government spending required to close that gap, and we have to show our work here. So first of all, I have the spending multiplier calculation there of five. We have a gap that is negative $50 million. So in order to close that gap, we need to have a uh, $50 million increase in aggregate demand or real GDP. And so we're going to work backwards here. So we have our new spending of $50 million. We're gonna work backwards and divide by the multiplier of five, and that gives us $10 million of spending uh, that we need in order to close that gap. All right, on to the next part of C. We're gonna show that uh, change of, uh, regarding the government spending on the graph we already drew earlier. So there it is right there. It's a rightward shift of the aggregate demand curve, and we are supposed to label the new price level. I have it labeled there, PL2, as we've been instructed. I also added Y2 below the full employment level of output of YF, but that I don't think is required. All right, moving on to the next part. We're going to now draw a loanable funds graph to show the impact of that change we just saw 
um, on the equilibrium interest rate, or at least the change of the government spending, the increase in government spending. So here we go. There are two possibilities here. We're going to have a loanable funds market graph. I prefer decreasing the supply of loanable funds, which increases the equilibrium real interest rate. But a perfectly acceptable answer will also be to rightward shift the investment demand curve. And I don't think you have to have SS or ID. That's the way I often do it, but just a supply and demand, I think will be just fine, or S and D, all right? Uh, so that's the impact of crowding out, essentially. That's what we've got there. And either one of those will be acceptable, at least I expect. Moving on to the next part, uh, based on the interest rate change we just saw, remember the interest rate went up, what is going to happen to the price of previously issued bonds? And that is going to be a decrease. And that's because there's an inverse relationship between interest rates and the prices of previously issued bonds. All right, what's gonna to happen to the rate of economic growth in the long run? Now we have to explain this also. The economic growth is going to decrease because the higher interest rate will cause less gross investment and therefore less capital formation. You're definitely going to need to mention the word capital is what I expect, all right? So less capital formation. On to question number two. The economy of Norlandia is in short run equilibrium with an actual inflation rate that is currently higher than the expected inflation rate. We're going to draw the short run and long run Phillips curve and label the short run equilibrium as point X. So there we go. We have our long run Phillips curve with the natural rate of unemployment below it, a downward sloping short run Phillips curve, and we are above the intersection between the two curves. At that intersection, that's where we find our expected inflation rate and the expected inflation rate is higher than, or excuse me, the actual inflation rate is higher than the expected inflation rate. So we're up high on that short run Phillips curve and that's why we have that point labeled X right there, All right? I don't think you will actually need to bring it to the axes, but I always like to, just to make sure. Moving on to the next part of question number two, we have the banking system, we have ample reserves. This is one of the first, and there's also one in the other one, the first questions about the ample reserves system. So we are going to identify a specific monetary policy action that the central bank of Norlandia will, uh, would bring or would take to bring uh, the inflation rate closer to the expected inflation rate. So we want to lower inflation. That's what we're trying to do here. And in order to do that, we need to raise interest rates. When this is an ample reserve system, we are going to be increasing interest on reserves, or you could also say increase administered rates. Those are the answers I expect we will be looking for. And that's because we have a ample reserve system, not a scarce reserve system here. All right, on to uh, the next part. Part C, Norlandia has an open economy and a flexible exchange rate based solely on the effect of the monetary policy action we just saw. We're only looking at the interest rates here. Will there be an increase, decrease, or no change of the flow of international financial capital into Norlandia? And we have to explain here. So here's our answer. We're going to see an increase or an inflow, right? Uh, and that's because the higher interest rates that we just saw because of the uh, monetary policy action means that foreign investors will seek those high interest rates, right? They're going to seek those high interest rates and purchase interest bearing assets in Norlandia, right? Uh, I think there's a lot of ways you could say this, maybe saving in Norlandia banks or whatever it is, but they seek those high interest rates. So we see a capital inflow or an increase in that inflow. All right, on to part D. Uh, based on the answer we just talked about in part C, what will happen to the international value of Norlandia's currency? And again, we have to explain. Here it is, it's an increase, or you could say appreciate, because the capital inflow will cause an increase in the demand for Norlandia's currency. The supply will also decrease, but I'm not sure if that will be accepted by itself. I think you could add it in there, but the demand is, the, I think, going to be the focus here. Um, I'm not sure whether or not only supply being accepted will be enough here, all right? Now we're going to move on to question number three. Uh, we're going to assume that the country of Zeta uh, has a civilian non-institutionalized population that is 16 and over of a million people. The labor force participation rate is 70% and the unemployment rate is 9% while the natural rate of unemployment is 5%. Now we have to calculate the number of people that are unemployed. This is an interesting calculation that I haven't seen uh, before, at least not that I can recall. So here's our calculations here. We have the labor force. I'm going to calculate that first. It's the million people that are in the population, uh, the working age population times the 70%. That means there are 700,000 people within the labor force. And the labor force 
9% of those are unemployed. And so we take the 700,000 times the 9%, that gives us 63,000 people that are unemployed, all right? And I believe only the second calculation will be uh, mostly required, but I'm not sure they might want you to have both of those there. All right, on to the next part. Is Zeta, uh, the economy of Zeta, currently experiencing a recessionary gap, an inflationary gap, or no output gap? And we have to explain again. So here we go. We have a recessionary gap. It's a recessionary gap because the unemployment rate of 9% is greater than that natural rate of unemployment. I'm taking the explanation a step further just to make sure that I get this point as best I can. Uh, it means that real output is less than the full employment level of output. I decided to connect it back to that ASAD model just to make sure that I'm covering all my bases here. On to the next one. Uh, part C, consumer and capital goods are produced in the country of Zeta. We're going to draw a correctly labeled graph of the production possibilities curve and indicate a point labeled A that represents the current state of Zeta's economy. Here it is there, we have a recessionary gap, so we put point A within the production possibilities curve, showing an inefficient use of resources, we've got high levels of unemployment, and so we are underproducing both consumer goods and capital goods. On to the next part. So if some individuals who are counted as employed, unemployed stop looking for work, what will happen to each of the following? First, the labor force participation rate, and we have to explain. So we're going to see a decrease in that labor force participation rate because discouraged workers, those, of, those people who are no longer looking for work, are not part of the labor force. So we see a decrease in the unemployed people and a decrease in the number of people that are in the labor force, and that and that's what's going to happen. So the labor force participation rate and population hasn't changed though. And so the labor force participation rate has now decreased. On to the next part. What's going to happen to the unemployment rate? Same thing. Those unemployed workers who stop looking for work, they are now discouraged workers, no longer considered unemployed. And as a result, the unemployment rate falls. And there you have it. That's my best guess answers for this year's set one questions for macroeconomics. Again, tell your friends about ReviewEcon.com next year. Uh, make sure they know about this if they're taking the micro or macro AP classes. Thank you so much for all the support. I really appreciate everybody. Take care.